we're in the exhibition space, uh, one of two exhibition spaces uh, dedicated to Tris von Michel, a young British artist uh, who's showing for the very first time in Paris. In fact, I think for the first time in France, to court. He was trained as a photographer originally and found it quite unsatisfying making photographs that were then hung on the wall quite simply. So for his graduation project in art school, he decided what he would do was rent an apartment, a kind of GDR apartment in Leipzig, and uh, shred all of his entire archive of photographs, family photographs, photographs he had taken, photographs of objects he'd made, everything. He sat for a month with a little paper shredder and shred every single one of them. He never showed this shredded archive. It was simply the act of destroying every trace of, uh, of what he had made and what had kind of the history that included him that was part of his first project. And thus began a practice of finding a way of, of being interested in, on the one hand, history and the way stories are told and kind of shredding them or collaging them creating a new history from bits and pieces of the past. I would say that the spoken word is in fact his central medium. Whatever you may find in the exhibition, whatever objects, uh, traces, papers, in fact it's the spoken word that really is uh, where he starts, where every story for him starts. He's an artist who performs, um, and I would say that's yeah, the, the very center of his practice. In this case, and for the exhibition of the Jeux de Paume, he will uh, encircle the history of Henri Chopin, a little known, kind of obscure figure, but important figure of the post-war avant-garde. And uh, Tris was, has been interested in Chopin since 2005. Uh, so for that many years, he has been, let's say, on a search to find Chopin who died last year, just three weeks after Tris finally met him for the first time. But this search is a quite unique one, an interesting one. The search for Chopin began when Tris asked his father why it is that the family ended up in South End on Sea, uh, which is where Tris was born. And his father replied something like, um, the only answer I can give you is that you have to ask Henri Chopin. All you need to know is he's 82 years old, loves quail eggs, and lives in Paris. And thus began uh, Tris von Michel's search for Chopin. I mean, I, this is just one part of a larger story where you understand something about the absurdity, in a way, of the way Tris approaches uh, his investigations, which mix fact and fiction, coincidence and chance, uh, and some hardcore research as well. This installation is called Fighting Chopin and Notes 2005 to 2009. Uh, the work started around 2005, but in a sense, this was an attempt to conclude it after four years, but actually may not happen. It may continue again. This here is the archive of material that I'm changing and revisiting based upon Chopin and my kind of journey or quest for Chopin which is a kind of a narrative that evolved over time, but it wasn't as if I actually had it scripted or intended that way, but it kind of ended up being a pursuit for Chopin, not the, uh, obviously the composer anymore, but only Chopin. And this work is now still evolving, and this is uh, another part of the archive over here, which is the DVD work, which is also the, the magazine that he published, which is some of the um, excerpts here, which have a lot of material from other artists that he'd worked with or collaborators playwrights, actors. Um, so this is kind of the moment, the phase of showing an archive influx that's continuing. There is a lot, in a way, very kind of specific information about him that concentrates on him as like a sound poet or a concrete poetry. But at the same time, I think he was always very much eager to position himself away from any movement from the concrete poets or the fluxus movement. And I think he always wanted to, to work that way and much more as a collaborator working as a publisher or a playwright or even as a gallerist at a certain time as well in Paris. So in a way that is also a part of the work and process is kind of like working through the material of his life, through documents and posters, through, through publications that he made. But basically in the broad sense, he was born in 1922. He died in 2008, so you know, he lived a long life, 85. And uh, he was an artist that often used, well, working with publishing, printed material, typewriter poems he's very well known for but also in a simple sense just all these kind of like phonetic kind of sonic explorations, narration, abstract narration and
kind of voice, and that was his main thing. Oh, it's, oh, often anyway, with the reel-to-reel -reel machine and the microphone. And that was my interest anyway, ideas of like narration and voice. And the printed material thing, I, I find it interesting, but it's something that I actually like to kind of explore this, the content much more in the improvisational sense, in a performance, live tense, so with an egg timer and duration. And that's when I try to deconstruct the, the narratives. The first time I heard of him was actually in the Lake District, which is why this image here is there, which is also, I, this is um, a Merzbau. This is basically a photograph of Kirk Schwitter's Merzbau, one of his studios or homes or installations. This was actually bombed in Hanover and then it was reconstructed. And I, I saw this reconstruction in Rotterdam. And at the same time, the narrative started when I was in the Lake District, which is where the story already starts. And I visited uh, Kirk Schwitter's house, his little kind of, well, where he died as well, and his little kind of museum, which is probably the size of his room. And it kind of started in that sense of me questioning a certain position of my kind of origins, in, or Northern England, or Southern England, wherever I was from, and finding this, this kind of avant-garde kind of, you know, in a way, again, Coach Willis is somebody who, like Chopin, is very diverse in what he did, and finding that he died in Ambleside, he was in the Lake District, such a small pocket in England, beautiful kind of countryside, and I wondered, that, that kind of quest of ideas of, of an origin or an ending was a starting point. And that's why I asked my dad about, you know, the positioning in England. And I think maybe after visiting Coachville's house, my dad was in a kind of a more um, playful mood and maybe wanted to kind of play around a little bit with the wording and, and speculate a little bit, put me on a journey. But not that he knew that I'd actually spend the next four years of my life actually searching for Chopin. He probably doesn't even know that, I, you know, that I'm still reconfiguring it. But it, it's very much based upon a, a very simple table conversation and a visit to a small room, you know, in England. And that's how the story always starts. Every time I perform, it's the same. After years now, I can't derail. The story always starts the same way, it often ends the same way. So that's how it started, yeah. As for the fiction, the truth in it, that's, uh, that's another thing altogether. But.